And the content of Hill's transmission here indicates that he talked to James Tagg. He says, I have one guy that was possibly hit by a ricochet from the bullet off the concrete. That's James Tagg. And James Tagg told the Warren Commission, a crowd of people, several people, were starting to come down into that area where he was running. He's talking about Clyde Haygood, who was running up the grassy knoll to the overpass. And the people pointing, and excitement up there, and so on. And about that time, a patrolman, who evidently had been stationed under the triple underpass, walked up and said, what happened? And I said, I don't know, something. He has to be talking about L.L. Hill here. There's nobody else in any of the evidence it could be. And he also says, and the patrolman said, well, I saw something fly off the back on the street, or fly off back on the street. Well, what this means is this patrolman, who has to be L.L. Hill, was there during the assassination. So why is he there? He had to have been told to go there, but it's not on the radio. The last time we hear him on the radio... He's out doing a call uh, in District 22. So he had to have been told to go to Dealey Plaza, and that's why they misidentified him. So we wouldn't know that, because he was told to go there to perform a conspiracy task. And what else did he do? He gave Tippett's gun to Sergeant Owens. And the behavior of Hill is very weird. If you uh, look at the map here, I've noted at 1237, this call I've been talking about, where he called in from Dealey Plaza with witness information. And then 10 minutes later, he calls in and says that he is at Continental and Industrial. And then he's told to go to Elman Houston from there. Now, he's already been in Dealey Plaza 10 minutes before, and yet... At 12.47, he's being told to go to Dealey Plaza. So after being at the triple underpass at 12.37, why does he call in 10 minutes later, ask him where they want him to go, and he's sent to the triple underpass again? Uh, you might think we've missed some of the dialogue somewhere, but it's not on the radio. So I, I think what this is, is that it was realized in real time by somebody that they didn't want 22 on the radio. And yet, after he called in the, on the radio, they decided they wanted to make it look like he hadn't been in Dealey Plaza. And one way to do that is to have him arriving in Dealey Plaza uh, 10 minutes later. So it looks like he's just arriving at 1247, if you don't know he was already there at 1237. So what they're doing is they're hiding the fact that L.L. Hill was in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination. And after 1237, somebody who heard him on the radio apparently thought it was very important to make it look like he hadn't been in Dealey Plaza. So they had him get into his car and drive away and drive back to just be arriving at Dealey Plaza at 1247 or 1248 and you can see him in the uh, Martin film at the end of the Martin film car 3 is just arriving in Dealey Plaza and car 3 is L.L. Hill's car so there's photographic proof that he is arriving at 1248 or so but we already know from the recording that he was in Dealey Plaza at 1237 so they're hiding the fact that he was in Dealey Plaza when JFK was shot. And that means he has a conspiracy task to perform in Dealey Plaza. And he's the guy who gave Tippett's gun to Sergeant Owens. And we can't demonstrate the chain of custody of uh, Tippett's gun, in, in quotation marks, from 10th Street because Calloway took the gun away from uh, 10th Street. And then we don't know for sure that he get, came back with the gun. We know Sergeant Croy had a gun, but then we don't know what Sergeant Croy did with the gun. So we don't have a chain of custody for the gun that ended up in evidence. 
and L.L. Hill was in Dealey Plaza to do something that they don't want us to know about. So I think what this means is that L.L. Hill got Tippett's gun in Dealey Plaza, that the gun on 10th Street was not Tippett's gun, the gun that Croy was holding was not Tippett's gun, but Tippett's gun was in Dealey Plaza and it was used in the assassination. And they wanted to make sure that if they needed to explain evidence of a 38 being used to shoot the president, that they would be able to blame somebody who was dead, and that's J.D. Tippett. So I think L.L. L. Hill is in Dealey Plaza to collect Tippett's gun. And so the L.L. L. Hill connection is what leads me to believe that the gun that was being used by William Greer was actually J.D. Tippett's gun. I can only speculate as to how he has got J.D. Tippett's gun. J.D. Tippett must have been involved in some way and must have been told something and must have given his gun to somebody who gave it to William Greer. Now, the theory that William Greer shot anybody is generally considered to be a silly, disproved theory. Anyone who tells you that it's debunked, however, is either lying or a fucking idiot. And don't believe anything else they say unless you can verify it. It's absolutely clear to me, after having studied this for quite a long time, that William Greer did shoot a gun. And that in frame, the Zapruder frame 304 that this comes from, that he has something up in front of his face that has been hidden by a video editor by painting uh, flesh tone lines and dark lines on the object. And uh, I think that's meant to have it blend into the face as you're watching the movie. Uh, it doesn't hide it if you actually uh, examine the details as I have done. But there's no question whatsoever in my mind that in frame 304, William Greer is holding an object up in front of his face there. I don't think he'd fire it in that position because, well, I don't know, I've never fired a gun, but it's kind of close to your eyes there, isn't it? Also at this point, uh, Roy Kellerman has his left hand, he has a finger in his ear. He's protecting his ears from the sound of this gun. So Roy Kellerman knows what's happening. And now I'm going to show frames 302, 303, and 304 here over and over. And you should look at William Greer, and you can see that something is happening, that he's not only holding something up in his left arm, his left hand, but he's also leaning into it. Uh, he's holding a gun there, and he's firing. This is not the headshot. I think he's firing in the JFK's torso, though I can't prove that. But the film has been edited, so frames are removed, and it's a little jerky. And some, some things have been obscured, but that's what's happening here. And I think if you don't believe me, you should watch it some more. And here in the next film, uh, which this covers the same frame, 304, you can see, if you care to look, that William Greer uh, reaches his left arm over his right shoulder in that area and then brings it back and then... Apparently, there is a gun in his hand. Now, you can't say, oh, that's definitely a gun, but there's something in his hand. And JFK was just shot, and he had just been turned around facing JFK, pointing whatever was in his hand at JFK. So, I don't think it's crazy to think that William Greer is the one who shot him. And this is an enlargement of that frame that shows him in the next film holding the gun. Now, yes, if there was nothing else, and I just had this, then of course you wouldn't believe he was holding a gun. But you have to cram some context into your mind. It's not just this. You could say, well, that alone doesn't prove it, but you have to put the context all together. He's, uh, he's shown uh, with a gun that's been covered up in the Zabruder film. He's shown with something in his hand in the next film. He was turned around and had something pointed at JFK. JFK was shot. You know? You gotta use some context. 
And this is from frame 322 of the Zapruder film, which is just about the same moment that uh, you can see he's got something in his hand in the next film. Well, you can see it here, too. And what do you think that is? His TV remote? No, it's a gun. And in the Mormon photo, apparently this is also the same time as frame 304, though that's not what they tell you. Uh, you can see the muzzle flash. I've got a, an example of a muzzle flash I got online in the color there. And you can see outlined by, or it's outlined, yeah, it's outlined by the, by Roy Kellerman's head there. You can see something that is shaped like a muzzle flash. It's brightly colored like a muzzle flash. It's at the end of whatever it is William Greer was pointing at JFK. Yeah, maybe it's something else. I don't know, but I think it's probably a gun. And to get in this a little more, I'll, I'll use Bobby Hargis here. He's the motorcycle officer, also in the Mormon photo. And he told the Warren Commission, when President Kennedy straightened back up in the car, the bullet hit him in the head, the one that killed him, and it seemed like his head exploded. And I was splattered with blood and brain and kind of bloody water. It wasn't really blood. So Hargis is describing two different events. One where President Kennedy straightens up, and the next when he's shot in the head. And if we look at the Zapruder film, uh, you can see that JFK straightens up after what we call the headshot in the Zapruder film, but it's only after that here in frame 318 where you can see the shot that Hargis describes as the one that killed him. You can't see it very well, it's very blurred, but this is what happens after he straightens up. He gets shot again in the head, and just as Hargis said. And so we see one head shot, the one that everybody calls the head shot, and then there's another one after that. And son of a gun! William Greer's arm is up there again. We only see it in one frame here, and people will argue, well, it's moving too fast to be his arm, but that's because frames have been removed from the film, and they can't remove them all. Uh, so they left one in with his arm up, and they blurred it. Either that or it was originally blurred. It might have been the one that was least obvious. And when you're watching the film, you never notice this anyway. It's only if you examine it frame by frame. There's nothing that could be other than William Greer's arm. Now, I'm not certain that he fired this shot that Hargis is talking about. I think William Greer was ready to fire another shot, but that it, maybe it came from behind the picket fence, or maybe he fired here too. I don't know. You can't, you can't know everything. But you can know that William Greer had something in his left hand that he was pointing at Kennedy while Kennedy was being shot. And I think that's the important point for this video. And there's more proof that William Greer fired a gun because he also shot John Connolly. And don't start whining about, oh, why would he shoot John Connolly? I don't want to hear it. I'm not talking about why. I'm talking about the fact that he did. And we can tell this in various ways. One of these ways is by listening to Dan Rather after he watched a film in which he saw, obviously, when John Connolly was shot, he saw that it was when John Connolly was turned around and facing the sniper's window. That's when John Connolly was shot, according to Dan Rather, who saw a film where he could see that. Governor Connolly in the seat right in front of the president. And by the way, the governor had his, his suit coat open. His suit was not buttoned. Uh, perhaps he either heard the shot or somehow he knew that something was wrong because the picture shows just after that first shot hit the president. The governor turned in something in this manner with his right arm outstretched back toward the president as if to say what's wrong or what happened or say something and exposed the entire white front shirt of the governor to the full view of the assassin's window. And as the governor was in this position and President Kennedy behind him was slumped slightly over, a shot clearly hit the front of Governor Connolly. And if you're watching on YouTube, this is the end of part three.